Check, check, check. One, two, three, four, five. Okie dokie, gonna get started. Oh, that's not the right screen. <laughs> Hi friends. <laughs> Happy Sunday. Welcome back to Zine Dreams. I am Jen Della Vega. This is a stream uh, exploring independent zines, commercial magazines, how they're structured, how they're made, tips for curation, and other ways to express yourself with printed matter. Last time, this was already a couple weeks ago, um, I've taken a couple Sundays off because, you know, hashtag life. Um, but the last time we talked about zines on a Sunday, uh, we covered uh, short stack Grits. Short Stack is a series of um, independently made, very specialty subject zines that are all hand stitched. And uh, we looked at a purple one that was all about grits, and it was really cool. Uh, we also looked at a commercial zine from Fine Cooking, and they released a special edition all sides issue. And um, it was really funny to look at, you know, where the magazine was printed and understand, like, their view of, like, what fine cooking was. Um, you can catch up on all those previous clips here on my channel if you click on videos, or you can check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash J-E-N-N-D-L-V for the I archive. I always upload those after every stream, including this one after we finish. Uh, I'm talking to myself in the future. Don't forget to upload this. Yeah, so how are we today? Wow, there's five of you watching. Hello. Are you here to watch me read Terry Pratchett? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to read very, very short prologue from Terry Pratchett's uh, The Color of Magic. This is from the Discworld series. Good morning, Martin. Um, also going to go through this very, very thick... I haven't really looked at it since I bought it years ago, but um, the Thanksgiving issue of Food and Wine. I'll explain why I'm reading this right now, but um, these are the only two things that I'm going to be doing on the stream today. Yeah, hi Matt, good morning. 
Matt says, I really need to read more Discworld. Um, I was on a kick of reading these. Maybe it was it last summer. Uh, one of my really, really dear friends and used to be neighbor, Tommy Siegel, who is an illustrator um, and band person about town. He uh, lent me the first couple books of Discworld. Well, not the first couple. Um, he encouraged me to jump around. <laughs> So uh, I started with um, Men at Arms and Going Postal. Uh, I love the whole Carrot carrot series. Um, Color of Magic has to do with a character called Rincewind, who I don't like. <laughs> so I've sort of skipped around. Um, I didn't actually read this one. But the reason why I want to read part of this book is because... Um, this is such a, 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 no, a knotted situation. So I record remotely right now for the podcast Fun City. But before this, we were recording in a studio called Fortunate Horse. And we shared the studio with uh, another podcast called Rude Tales of Magic. So if you know Taylor from Fun City, as you know, he plays all the bad boys. He produces Rude Tales of Magic, and he's that voice at the very beginning of Rude Tales that's like, ah, take off your coat, you know, that guy. Um, that's Taylor. Um, so he owns a studio, and um, Rude Tales of Magic did a live stream on Friday, and it was $5, and it was amazing. It was so funny and crazy. Um, but the masterful thing that they did was there's this website called Cameo where you can pay celebrities to like do, you know, 30 second happy birthday videos for your friends. Um, they had Frodo, not Frodo, um, Sean Astin, Samwise Gamgee do the intro for the live stream. And he was like, huh, Rude Tales of Magic. I don't know what this is, but uh, it reminds me of of the prologue from The Color of Magic. And so he literally left the camera, like he, he left it recording and got up to go get his copy of <laughs> Terry Pratchett's The Color of Magic and then started reading it. But then they cut it off um, because, you know, they wanted to start the stream. <laughs> but they played a little clip of him reading it at the end of the stream and it was quite amazing. And so I wanted to actually read the prologue in full for people who wanted to hear it. I'm trying to see how many of these Discworld books that I've actually read. Um, so I've read Mort. Mort was really good. Okay, so I've read Mort. Guards, Guards. Uh, Small Gods. Men at Arms. Feet of Clay. Uh, wow, okay. Going Postal. Uh, wow, I've only read six of these. There's a bunch. There's a bunch of these books. If you don't know Discworld, it's a whole universe. I believe Color of Magic is the first one, right? I think so. Okay. <laughs> you read a bunch when you were younger. You can't remember any of them now. Yeah. Um, when did this come out? This came out in 1983. And then reissued a bunch of times. So let me find this prologue. It's only two pages. Oh, he was in the Color of Magic movie? Okay, I didn't... <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> oh my god, Tim Curry, really? I have to watch this now. I'm sure it was a wild movie. Okay, I'm going to read The Color of Magic Prologue. Hello from 24C. Welcome to the stream. You just finished Carpe Jugulum. It's so good. Okay, I have to, I have to catch up on it. I, maybe I'll pick these back up. Even though I don't like Rincewind. <laughs> okay, The Color of Magic Prologue. Uh... Read in full by me, Jen, as attempted by Sean Astin on the Rude Tales of Magic stream. <laughs> okay. The Color of Magic. 
in a distant and second-hand set of dimensions, in an astral plane that was never meant to fly. The curling star mists waver and part. See? Great Atuin, the turtle comes, swimming slowly through the interstellar gulf. Hydrogen frost on his ponderous limbs, his huge and ancient shell pocked with meteor craters. Through sea-sized eyes that are crusted with rheum and asteroid dust, he stares fixedly at the destination. In a brain bigger than a city, with geological slowness, he thinks only of the weight. Most of the weight is, of course, accounted for by Beryllia, Tubul, Great Tifon, and Jerakin. The four giant elephants upon whose broad and star-tanned shoulders the disk of the world rests, garlanded by the long waterfall at its vast circumference and domed by the baby blue vault of heaven. Astropsychology has been, as yet, unable to establish what they think about. The Great Turtle was a mere hypothesis until the day the small and secretive kingdom of Krull whose rimmost mountains project out over the rimfall, built a gantry and pulley arrangement at the tip of the most precipitous crag and lowered several observers over the edge in a quartz-windowed brass vessel to peer through the mist veils. The, ast the early astrozoologists, hauled back from their long dangle by enormous teams of slaves, oof, were able to bring back much information about the shape and nature of Atuin and the elephants, but this did not resolve fundamental questions about the nature and purpose of the universe. For example, what was Atuin's actual sex? This vital question, said the astrozoologists with mounting authority, would not be answered until a larger and more powerful gantry was constructed for a deep space vessel. In the meantime, they could only speculate about the revealed cosmos. There was, for example, the theory that Atuin had come from nowhere and would continue at a uniform crawl, or steady gait, into nowhere for all time. This theory was popular among academics. An alternative favored by those of a religious persuasion was that Atuin was crawling from the birthplace to the time of mating, as were all the stars in the sky, which were, obviously, also carried by giant turtles. When they arrived, they would briefly and passionately mate for the first and only time, and from that fire reunion, new turtles would, would be born to carry a new pattern of worlds. This was known as the Big Bang Hypothesis. Jesus Christ. Thus, it was that a young cosmocolonian of the Steady Gate faction testing a new telescope with which he hoped to make measurements of the precise albedo the great Atuin's right eye, was on his eventful evening the first outsider to see the smoke rise hubward from the burning of the oldest city in the world. Later that night, he became so engrossed in his studies he completely forgot about it. Nevertheless, he was the first. There were others. Uh, that was a long-running joke about the Big Bang. Thank you, Terry Pratchett. That was a prologue from The Color of Magic from the Discworld series. <laughs> I have a few of the other books here that I haven't read yet, but I will get to it eventually. But thank you, Sean Essen, for reminding me that I even had the book on my shelf. Has anyone else read the Discworld series? It's very, like, easy to read. I remember I, I got through each of the books, like, in two or three days. If that. So today, the food publication that we're going to be looking at is a very, very thick issue. I'm not going to cover everything in here because it's very large. Um, but Food and Wine, Thanksgiving, November 2007. Thanksgiving in uh, August, huh? What's September? I mean, it's never too early to think about Thanksgiving. But the reason, the reason why I'm going to be going through this issue is, um, I don't know how many of you work in the food world, but um, when it comes to food styling and publication and how slow the printing industry is right now, um, just because of like social distancing measures and safety, 
Um, a lot of magazines shoot their holiday content over the summer. So for me and some of my friends, like our work is mostly holiday based right now. And so we've got Thanksgiving on the, on the brain. Um, we don't want it to be here yet, but uh, it's just like a funny thing that a lot of food stylists and recipe developers and like the behind the scenes kind of food industry people think about Christmas and Thanksgiving and Hanukkah in June, July, August. <laughs> it's a weird thing. Totally weird. I, I got used to it after a couple years, but um, I just wanted to tell you that and then also go through this very large food and wine issue about Thanksgiving. So th just reminder, this is from 2007. So a lot has changed in the publishing industry and culinarily a lot has changed. Uh, I feel like a broken record every time I go through these, but like the coverage is very, very white. I mean, unsurprisingly, very, very white. It's aimed toward people that own homes or people who can afford to remodel their homes. Um, and right now I think the economy has changed so much that this is going to feel like super discordant as we like look through it. But just remember that as we're going, this is from another time, another timeline. <laughs> And I don't mean to, I, I, whatever I say about this, I don't mean to bag on food and wine. Like, I do like their publication a lot. Let's just make that clear. <laughs> so we're starting with the cover here. Um, boy, does this drive me nuts. There are three different typefaces on this cover. Can you spot them all? <laughs> so we have the sans serif up here, food and wine. We have an italicized. And then we have a script at the very bottom here as a call out. This is insane to me. Why would you have so many? I know. I know. Drives me insane. Um, so this has how many pages in it? Wow. 272 pages. And it retailed for $4.50. Holy crap. Something that's 200 and something pages would not cost four fifty dollars now. Wow, that's kind of a bargain. That is a pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize if I hover over your username and you have a crown or... um, Martin has a first next to his username because it says founder, five month subscriber. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so the cover story is here. Thanksgiving best menus from exotic to classic. Oh my god, already we're off to a bad start calling something exotic. Uh, 17 incredible South American wine bargains and the ultimate American cheese plate. I'm very curious to see how they define ultimate and American cheese. Because I have opinions about that. Opening her right up, we have an ad for Honda. Which is relevant because uh, I was watching Community and there's a whole episode about uh, guerrilla marketing in Honda. Um, so obviously this is geared toward people who can afford to buy a car and to remodel their kitchen. Because there's, there's stove Kenmore ads in here. Delta Airlines, people who can travel. This has changed drastically now. Screw Delta also. Um, Beyonce in an American Express. This is four ads before we've actually gotten any content. I mean, look at her though. Always a queen. Proudest accomplishment, winning my first Grammy. Okay, uh, Beyonce's perfect day. Lounging in the sun on a boat in the middle of nowhere with people I love. Well, I wish I could do that. Uh, my most unusual gift. Rhinestone studded pedicure toe spacers for painting your nails. Weird. Weird. Recent impulse by Lorraine Schwartz, Diamond Monkeys. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. She got diamond sculpture monkeys. Okay, never mind. Let's just not get too mad about this. Um, so our features. Dean Fearing. I don't know who that is. Uh, Tex-Mex Holiday Meal. So this is their feature page. I kind of like the layout of their feature page clean. It's not too busy. 
I hate the I hate having too many of these like splash call outs. A lot of other magazines are guilty. Like Seventeen, Cosmo, and Shape magazine, they all have these like like <laughs> interruptions, like the call outs, the call to actions, and the page numbers. I think th having one is just fine. An ad for a Cadillac. Okay, so far we are about 10 pages in. There are no people of color. Oregon's Whiskey Trail Blazers take on Kentucky Bourbons and some more white men here. Um, ad for Rolex. Wow, I'm really glad that I read most of these things online because I'm spared all of these so many ads. And Starbucks, my goodness. Crate and Barrel. Okay. This is something that uh, we saw in the Fine Cooking magazine as well, which is uh, a whole page dedicated to all the recipes in here. And so this is not the full table of contents, but um, they have a key at the top here, color-coded key, so that you can just scan through the recipes and be like, oh, this one is vegetarian and I can, be made it, I can make it quick. So I, I really like that um, they make it easy for you to jump ahead if you really wanted to. I appreciate that. Oh, it's so funny when print magazines uh, call out websites because URLs are like <laughs> web extras, <laughs> foodandwine.com slash recipes. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, an ad for Pergo. Uh, flooring. Okay, so people who can remodel again. Level vodka. I don't think I've ever had level vodka. They have a whole call-out page for fast-forwarding to wines that they talk about. Appropriate, because that's their name, food and wine. And then a third call-out page for menus. I think this is dope. So this is like um, another layer of, of organizing content. So this is like, this is like curation level stuff. So taking a large amount of information and making it easier to browse is, is always appreciated. Especially in a 272 page magazine like this. Advertising for Bose and Jaguar. Oh my god, who can afford a freaking Jaguar? Ay ay. Raymond James. No people of color so far. Dear Kettle One Drinker. Oh my god, I remember these ads. Index all the things, I agree. Alright, let's look at this letter from the editor who is Dana Cohen, I believe. Look at her photo. Look at these shoulder pads. Lady. Uh, Thanksgiving can seem like a one-size-fits-all holiday. It can be the same whether you're celebrating in Dallas or New York, whether in your 20s or your 60s, with the same predictable turkey, stuffing sides, and pies. Well, we at Food & Wine believe it can be so much more than that. In this issue, we visit star chef Dean Fearing in Dallas for a full meal of Tex-Mex touches. Fun. From tortillas in the stuffing to the spiced pecan cream in the soup. Wow. Um, and for Thanksgiving in your 20s, 40s, 60s, our test kitchen cooks imagined a holiday appropriate for different stages of life. Whoa, I'm probably going to have a difference of opinion here. <laughs> Melissa Rubel's Indian-inspired menu is for 20-somethings who want to experiment. Grace Parisi made the perfect 40-something family Thanksgiving with plenty of make-ahead dishes. Um, Marsha Kiesel took on the extravagant, elegant 60s. Perhaps the most daring Thanksgiving move would be to mix and match recipes from the entire issue. Agreed. Uh, for the ideal hors d'oeuvre, I begin with Laura Whirlin's story and the Great American Cheese Plate. If we're going to serve a turkey, I'd opt for one from Bruce Idell's recipes in a meat master cooks in his dream kitchen. Dr. Pepper glazed ham, hell yeah, or stuffed pork roast would be sublime. Wow, wow, wow. I'll have to make them for myself for my one of my own one-of-a-kind holiday. Okay, I can get down with parts of this <laughs> yeah oh and they have um a little call out of where they sourced some of the foods from the magazine which i think is a cool common practice that magazines are doing these days support small businesses and small farms right an ad for chrysler an ad for cartier we've got some letters from the editor here i mean letters to the editor excuse me um, we're gonna skip over them. Bertoli, so many white people. 
Oh, the whole page. This is the one of those uh, relic pages. That's a whole spread dedicated to the website. Cracks me up when print magazines dedicate space to, to websites. News and notes. To light a holiday table, I fill a clear vase with walnuts or hazelnuts in the shell and place a floating candle on top. Wait, what? <laughs> Why would you do that? Walnuts are so expensive. <laughs> I mean, sure. Like, if you had an abundance of walnuts and an empty vase, go for it. I just don't think I would go out of my way to buy one. Top Thanksgiving tips. Chef Mark Sullivan from San Francisco Spruce shares his secret for a juicy bird. He wraps it in parchment paper, then foil, roasts at a low temperature until it's nearly cooked, then removes the foil and parchment and browns it in the hot oven until the skin is crisp. Interesting. I've never heard of wrapping it in parchment and then foil. Hmm. Invitations? Oh my god. When is the last time someone has sent you a paper invitation to something? That wasn't a wedding. Centerpieces. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Stationery. Oh boy. Oh boy. Florists. Who can afford these things? I cannot. <laughs> Martin's never read the letter section of a magazine. I sometimes do. For Cook's Illustrated, I do. Because it's usually a lot of really helpful stuff. Um, but a lot of the time it's, you know, uh, people complaining. Oh, I've actually seen this product and I've tried it. Champagne in Bloom. Preserved hibiscus flowers newly imported from Australia. Give a glass of sparkling wine a pretty pink. It's, um, yeah, it's like hibiscus flowers preserved in syrup. And then you can put them at the bottom of champagne glasses. Uh, I think it, it runs about like 15 bucks for like a jar. And it's, it's pretty, it's pretty special and fun. But, you know, once in a while kind of a thing. Uh, wine takes flight, new onboard options. And so they have like f airlines that have uh, wines. So JetBlue has wine on it. Eurofly, I've never heard of this airline. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, letter section does seem like the forum for will actually, you know, like the comic book guy from The Simpsons. <laughs> Oh, here's their uh, their version of Hot or Not, or Tired and Wired. Stale versus Fresh. Stale, tuna. Fresh, eel. <laughs> Stale, small plates. Fresh, family style. <laughs> Stale, meatballs. Fresh, we're going back to meatloaf. <laughs> Stale, speakeasies. <laughs> Fresh, tiki bars. Stale, wine flights. Fresh, Ham flights. <laughs> Actually, I agree with that. Stale. Gelato. Fresh. Milkshakes. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They actually printed this. It's like a hot or not, but with like trends and stuff. It's amazing. Meat of the month. Let me read that. Tracy O'Grady, a chef at Willow Restaurant in Arlington, Virginia, worked with her butcher to create a cut of pork dubbed the two-bone rib rack. Fist, a fist of tender, juicy meat attached to the rib bones, which begs the question, can one patent a cut of meat? It looks good. It, well, it just looks like a double a double chop. Um, I do this with uh, lamb chops. Because, you know, lamb chops can be like little lollipops. Well, if you just wanted a bit more, you just do a double, which is just not cutting them apart, y'all. That's <laughs> uh, funny. Okay, first... No, that's not a person of color. It's just really dark. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. It's an M&M's ad. What ad is this? Uh, cruise lines. So these are people that go on, go on cruises. Hotel news. An ad for Ratatouille. Ooh! Wait. San Francisco-based quarterly journal covers e ethos and ethics of carnivorism with provocative photos and smart protein-packed articles. Meat paper. I don't think I have any copies of meat paper. Yeah, they have a little throw to printed materials here, which is dope. Appreciated. Okay, ad for ratatouille. An ad for Thermador ovens. Sinks. 
a feature on Washington, D.C. Um, ad for Belvedere Vodka. Okay, first people of color are printed in black and white for an ad for a Macy's book called Great Gatherings. Boy. <laughs> Look, see. The first people of color in this magazine have been de deprived of color. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Okay, so that's Nancy Silverton. Okay, can't Cora. Govind Armstrong. Takashi Yagihashi. Marcus Samuelson. Ming Sai. Okay. They're all men. No women of color. So far, and we are on page what? 58, 59, 60, 61. We're on page 61 of 272 of Food and Wine, and we have no women of color yet. <laughs> this is <laughs> upsetting. Uh, yes, so many vodka ads, for sure. There are, um, let's see, there's a feature here on Memphis, Tennessee, St. Louis, Missouri. This whole thing is assuming that we are traveling. Cajun Country by Car, Native Sons Free Willing Tour, and they are white. <laughs> Intensely porky Cajun sausage called Bowdoin inspires a Louisiana road trip that starts at a restaurant in New Orleans and ends at a roadhouse in, Bo in Bro Bridge. We got a ad for Aruba targeted at New Yorkers. New Yorkers love our restaurants enough said. Wow. That's what this ad says for Aruba. As if New Yorkers are like the coolest, coolest ass shit ever. I mean, some of us are. But, <laughs> but that's just really funny that New York culturally is held up in that regard. You know? Uh, okay. Got a feature here. Travel Channel. I think this was around the time in 2007 when Travel Channel was pivoting to a lot of food content. Because Travel Channel did not used to focus on food. But now, um, you know, because of Anthony Bourdain back then, uh, they started covering a lot more food. Okay. Got more. Got this Cajun tour. I want to get to the Thanksgiving stuff. We've got a Jeep ad. So many cars. Amsterdam ad. Cruise ad. Famous grouse, uh, which is a what? A scotch? Travel content about Europe and the Mediterranean. Ghirardelli. Oh my god. Travel cruise. This is a whole section on travel cruises. Culinary cruise news. Carnival cruise line. Oh, wow. There's a whole column here about culinary cruise news. Princess Cruise is launching a chef's table on all ships. Oh my god. Can you imagine being that reporter? Can you imagine being that reporter stuck on a cruise right now during quarantine? Jesus Christ. Uh, ad for Swanson Broth. Acceptable. Okay, here. Here's the first Thanksgiving content we're, we're reaching here. This is at page 87. Thanksgiving in your 20s, 40s, and 60s. First of all, why did they develop, uh, divide it into those age groups? Are they saying, you know, that people in their 60s can't enjoy an experimental Thanksgiving? I mean, yes, the letter of the editor at the very beginning framed it that you can mix and match. You're allowed to. But editorially, you know, why did they divide it by these ages? I feel like we could have used different descriptors for this. Instead of age, maybe we could have used, like, your openness to things. Thanksgiving in your 20s. For her irreverent take on the holiday, Melissa Rubo looks to India with yogurt marinated turkey breast and curried butternut squash. That makes a lot of sense because uh, if you've ever made chicken tikka masala at home, the chicken is marinated in yogurt first before you uh, bake it. Lovely. There's not very much editorializing here. That's kind of the only introduction that we got. Wow, wait, what? There's no context? 
That's disappointing. Um, so it starts out with a mango rosewater cocktail, Indian popcorn, inspired by Indian snacks called chaat. This crispy, spicy, salty combination of popcorn and bits of fried serrano chilies and shallots, perfect with cocktails. I'm not sure serrano chilies are very Indian, but I mean, if that's what you have, then sure. Interesting. Uh, pump okay, so in her reimagining of holiday pumpkin soup, uh, Melissa Rubel adds pumpkin to dal, a spicy, soupy Indian legume dish. Uh, result is a hearty, healthy soup with a lovely edge of sweetness. Pumpkin dal sounds pretty good. Where's the pinch of hing powder? Pretty much every um, recipe that I've seen adds a little pinch of hing powder at the end. Um, beautiful. Indian spice turkey breast. Roasting a whole turkey is always tricky since the breast can dry out while dark meat finishes cooking. To get around that problem, Melissa roasts turkey breast by itself. With the right amount of cooking, it's always juicy, especially in marinating the combination of lemon and yogurt. This is a trick that I've been doing, um, the past couple Thanksgivings. Um, I would buy the turkey in parts so that I, number one, don't have to break it down, and number two, have the room for it in my oven. My oven's pretty small, and so I can't fit uh, a normal roasting pan in it. And I'm always, well, lately I've been cooking for less and less people at Thanksgiving, so it's cool to be able to just buy the right amount of turkey that you need rather than committing to, like, a 12-pound turkey. <laughs> It's really cool that my uh, my Latin American market near my uh, in my neighborhood uh, sells turkey parts, so that I can buy you know four drumsticks for one breast, <laughs> which you know makes it look like a Cthulhu turkey. But whatever, man, it's my turkey. Fragrant cauliflower in tomato sauce. Holiday wines for twenty something. Oh boy. Indian inspired menu has an enormous range of bold exotic uh, exotic I hate it when they use exotic exotic flavors fruit okay Navarro Vineyards 2006 go worse Chamina that makes sense with Indian food the general rule with having um, spicier food is to have a sweeter sort of sweeter wine to like counteract it uh, a gamay noir rose nice and a mum cuve mum don't try to sell me mum. Sorry, I thought... <laughs> mum just reminds me of uh, college. <laughs> I guess I... W <laughs> okay, wait. Let's just rewind of my my privilege. I <laughs> I went to college in a wine, in wine country, basically. So mum is, like, cheap to us. <laughs> and cheap is not bad. It's just, like, crappy. <laughs> I didn't think... I didn't like mum. That's really funny. Just exposed some of my wine privilege from going to Davis, uh, Davis, University of California, Davis. Um, toasted coconut basmati rice as a side. Curry roasted butternut squash and chickpeas. That sounds like a good everyday dish. Ooh, listen to this. Chai spiced caramel fondue. Y'all, that sounds good. How do I spell what? Which one? Mum? Or Gerwitztramina? Oh, M U M M. <laughs> oh, chai spice caramel fondue. This luscious golden fondue laced with warming spices like ginger and cardamom is perfect after a heavy Thanksgiving meal. Dip anything you like in it, from apple and pineapple to ginger snap cookies. It can also be made ahead and served at room temperature, which is easier on the cook. Yo, I totally agree that fondue is a great. Thanksgiving option. I also wouldn't even serve it for the end. I would actually do a fondue in the beginning because you're sitting around so much, right? After after Thanksgiving, you mostly just want to um, watch movies, nap, play foot, watch football. <laughs> in my family, we would karaoke. <laughs> that doesn't require much movement. Yeah, at the end, you're way too full for fondue. I think fondue should be at the beginning. Even if it is sweet, who cares? Dessert first, y'all. 
Okay, let's see. Let's see how they editorialize Thanksgiving in your 40s. I am on the other side of 35, so they're probably speaking to me, but I will probably heartily disagree with what they try to prescribe me in this. Uh, Thanksgiving in your 40s. For Grace Parisi, Thanksgiving means family and plenty of kids. Oh my god, no! <laughs> So her meal is easy to make with classic turkey and stuffing. Oh my god, no. Y'all. I mean, it does look beautiful. I don't, I don't want to readily assume now in 2020, 40 means that there are kids around. Yeah, you knew they would mention kids, huh? <laughs> uh, it's just like this expectation there are going to be kids when you're 40. Okay, let's see. The opening dish, potato chips with chef pepper jelly and bacon. I do agree that that is easy to make. <laughs> but I don't know if that is Thanksgiving material. Roasted turkey with Italian sausage stuffing. So they're, go they're leaning towards some ready-made stuff or things that you can leave alone. This, this is a marvelous turkey. It's simple, satisfying, and completely delicious. Uh, since Grace is a big fan of sweet Italian sausage, which is always in the rice-based stuff she ate as a kid, she often adds it to the dressing. The fennel seed in the sausage truly elevates the dish. I don't disagree that sausage would be good on the inside. It's just you got to be careful when you're making turkeys. Um, if you're making, if you're putting another meat inside of it, you got to make sure that that meat is either par-cooked or fully cooked before you put it in there because they're going to cook at two different rates and you don't want the turkey to be done and then the meat on the inside be underdone. Um, Alton Brown has an argument for why you shouldn't stuff the turkey uh, with, with bread or like stuffing or dressing uh, because of that. Because you're dripping you know, underdone chicken juice onto the bread, and then the bread is so far inward that it might not cook fully to temperature. And when you do fully cook that stuffing that's inside the bird to temperature, you will risk, like, overcooking the outside. So I've always been a fan of putting aromatics in the turkey, but not serving them to eat. You know, use those for, for like, broth another time or something. Uh, what's it called? Okay, so honey glazed roasted root vegetables. So the menu is much simpler here, which I get because they're trying to, you know, account for kids. But what if you have, like, older kids who, like, want to help, you know? <laughs> they're just only assuming that the kids are young. Like, kids can be older, and they can, like, they can help. <laughs> Um, green salad with tangy mustard vinegar. I just think that this menu is, like, a little too simple. If we're going to be featuring it in a big centerfold thing in the magazine. Should be cool, but also, like, easy to do. I don't know, I just, whatever. Whatever. Holiday wines for 40-somethings. Traditional Thanksgiving feast like this one pairs best with vibrantly flavored bottlings. Zesty sparkling wine, fruity Zinfandel, and sweet citrusy muscat. Okay, so this is where they balance it, right? Like, like, mom is really tired from making all the food. Let's treat yourself to a nice ass wine. I mean, the price points on these aren't much different from the 20 something ones, except for the Zinfandel, which I would not pay $48 for. I'm sorry, I have this stigma against Zinfandels. I think it's because I grew up around them <laughs> in California. Um, but cool recommendation, orange muscat. Never had that. Moving on, big block of ads. Uh, the rest of the 40s menu, roasted garlic, parmigiano broccoli, right? Mashed potatoes with horseradish cream, okay. Cream spinach with buttery crumbs, all right. Okay, the dessert is pumpkin cake with caramel cream cheese frosting. Why is everything so caramel based here? I mean, it does look great. I do need a stream where I just rag on wines. I should just be drinking a whole bottle of wine and rag on wines. I'm also just not an expert on wines. I have opinions, but I'm not an expert. <laughs> all the wine, all of my wine friends would get really mad at me if I did that. Maybe it should be a group stream. 
right where i have a zoom call with a few other wine people and ask them questions that'd be fun okay we're getting to the thanksgiving in your 60s Marsha kiesel's thanksgiving meal is elegant and luxe oh boy with delectable recipes like roasted capon and fig and prosciutto stuffing this does look amazing They haven't mentioned grandkids yet, but I bet they will. Um, it's assuming here that people in their 60s have money to burn and time to burn. Because <laughs> I bet these are going to be a little bit more labor intensive and the ingredients sound a, a bit more luxe. This is funny. Uh, the, food, the food photography for this is also next level. I love that soup. That soup looks... I want it just looking at it. Isn't that beautiful? Smoked mozzarella spread with flatbread crackers. Oh, my. Muscle and spinach bisque. Wow. Wow. This reminds me of one Thanksgiving where Jeff and Dylan got uh, dozens of oysters, and we did a jalapeno mignonette. Um, seafood is not a traditional, like, thanksgiving thing but we made it our tradition to have like oysters and reverse martinis while we were waiting for everything to cook i do like you know putting some seafood in there like you could probably do a whole seafood thanksgiving which would be dope <gasps> what if i did a seafood boil for thanksgiving and we deep fried a turkey and put it on top that'd be crazy right okay so instead of turkey, they're opting for capon, which is much more expensive. It's like a chicken's richer cousin. It's tender, flavorful, and most importantly, much more forgiving to cook than turkey. Oh, so they're assuming that these 60-year-olds cannot pay attention enough to cook something correctly. Yeah, seafood Thanksgiving would be fun. I don't like this framing that a person in their 60s is incapable of cooking something correctly. I don't like that more forgiving in this context. Like, I do use that phrase more forgiving because I'm incompetent at certain cooking skills, like baking. Like, I would say that pie crust is forgiving for a novice cook like me. <laughs> but framing this as, like, six-year-old people can't make a turkey is ridiculous. Smoky kale and olives. That sounds great. Spanish-inspired side dish made with kale and smoky paprika. Use very few ingredients, but tastes infinitely complex. Green beans with shallots and walnuts. I think that's fine. I don't think that's amazing. Um, holiday wines for 60-somethings. Okay. These are a little bit more expensive. A Sauve Blanc Pinot Noir of Tawny Port. This refined menu deserves wines with nuance. I think all menus deserve wines with nuance. <laughs> I just... Mm, assuming that 20-year-olds don't know anything about wine and that 60-year-olds have had all the wine is, is dangerous. I think that there are a lot of 60-year-olds who don't know much about wine and want to still learn. I mean, but that's why they have these pullouts in, at all, like recommending wine i mean that's what this whole magazine's for it's for recommending wine but you know i'm just trying to poke holes in in uh, how we editorialize things i mean i may be guilty of some of these same practices but the more i'm aware of it the more i'm less a less uh, likely to do it in the future uh they got sweet potatoes with apple butter as a side cranberry sauce with spiced pumpkin seeds that sounds good Sugar, water, cinnamon, raw pumpkin seeds, not roasted. Okay. Interesting. Oh, so they roast them in the recipe. All right. Um, their dessert is chestnut chocolate mousse. So no caramel here, which is great. Sophisticated flavor. Boy, the language about six-year-olds. They just want, they're just trying to shove you into this box of being sophisticated. Boy, boy, boy. How to get that look. And they got, like, styling. Probably divided by affordability. Oh my god, $133 for a fork and knife. Hell no. Hell no! When I'm 60, I will not be dropping $133 <laughs> on a fork and a knife, y'all. Y'all. 
$90 serving spoons. <sighs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> getting... <sighs> um, so far, we've only had women of color in name. We're at 100, page 118, and there have been no women of color pictured. There's a interview with a white guy. <laughs> Uh, an ad for Nissan, um, reviews of slow cookers. I totally endorse having a slow cooker, um, cause you can cook while you work. Slow cooker sour cream cheesecake, what? Say what? What? I've never heard of a sour cream cheesecake in a slow cooker. Well, I'm gonna have to try that. Six steps to reaching Yoki Nirvana. Okay. Um, another white woman. How a slim down chef stays thin. Oh boy. Talking about weight with a bearded white guy. Okay. Uh,. Oven fries, wonderful. Uh, side note, I watched a video recently with uh, America's Test Kitchen about oven fries, you know, baked oven fries, and they made this, like, hilarious slurry that they, they toss this gelatinous tapioca starch slurry over the fries and then bake them so that they have that crunchy crust. But I just think it's really funny that we have to alter them that much to get the texture that we want. I don't know. I think it's amazing and innovative, but also, like, defeating the purpose of something that's supposed to be so easy. Ooh, this looks good. Baking from the heartland. Oh, Nancy Olsen. Okay. Uh, gingerbread with quark cheesecake. Quark is a type of soft cheese. So making cheesecake not with cream cheese, but other cheeses. I think that's cool. Another white lady. Okay, where are my women of color? There's a land of lakes. Oh boy, problematic uh, ad here. Cacao reserve. Obligatory holiday ad for the magazine that you are actually reading. It's always funny when, when publications do this. Give the gift of food and wine. Give the gift is the most used phrase in all holiday advertising, at least from my perspective, from, from a person who's had to write that kind of copy all the time, give the gift of blank. Give the gift of blank, blank, blank. I need to think of a different phrase. Um, an article, another ad for a, another oven. How many ovens are people replacing? <laughs> that has been like the fourth oven advertisement in this. Like how many people are shopping for ovens? Seriously. Uh, Land Lakes does still have that logo. They've been called out. Okay, this is the cover story that uh, we were looking at. The Great American Cheese Plate. I was worried that they were going to um, slip in European cheeses, but it actually looks like they did their research and they're all American cheeses. And I've had a lot of these. So number one, Basket Molded Chev from Pure Luck. Um, I haven't had that. Uh, semi-soft crescenza I've had from Bellwether Farms. I've had Green Hill from Sweetgrass Dairy. I've had Bijou from Vermont Butter and Cheese. I've definitely had Flagship Reserve from Beecher's Handmade. I have had, uh, Sarvecchio Parmesan from Sartori. Rogue River Blue from Rogue Creamery. Did you hear that Rogue River Blue is the number one cheese in the world? An American blue cheese won the world championship for the first time ever this past year. And then number eight is Washed Ryan Grayson. Um, that I, I used Grayson in a lot of um, grilled cheese sandwiches. Yeah. Grayson's delicious. Ooh. Best American cheeses. I agree with a lot of these. Calgary Creamery's in here. Uh, Havarti from Wimet Valley. Oh, I've never had Franklin's Telem. A lot of these are from California. <laughs> Cypress Grove, which is based in Arcata, California. Um, Vermont Butter and Cheese I already mentioned. Hey, this is a good list of cheese. 
Pleasant Ridge Reserve from Uplands. Hell yeah, they're so good. They're from Wisconsin. And it's divided by texture of the cheese. So it's got like fresh, soft ripened, semi-soft, semi-hard, blue cheeses, wash rye, and hard cheese. I like how, how, how this, uh, this is divided, but I think the ads really take away from the feature. I, it was kind of cool to have the one layout page of, of, the, of everything, but then it got buried by all this text. I think this is way too much text. It's really cool, but totally got uh, shortchanged there. Oh, and a cool feature about cheese shops. Oh, I've only been to two of these. I've only been to two of the four. Uh, Foster and Dobbs Authentic Foods in Portland, Oregon. Premier Cheese Market in Minneapolis. I've been to Saxelby, which is in New York. And I've been to St. James Cheese in New Orleans. St. James is great. Um, I love cheese shops because you can ask so many questions and try all the cheeses. Okay, ads for Ghirardelli, Martini Rossi. Oh my gosh, so many ads. Uh, ad for Wisconsin cheese placed right near the cheese feature. <laughs> uh, America's new best new whiskeys. We're at page 170. And there are no women of color. This is disappointing. Yeah, more white guys. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that there were women of color in the production of this magazine and like authors, but none of it's been like really contextualized or shown. It's disappointing. Boy, look at this. This ad is trying to appeal to the artists who read this. <laughs> it's for wine. More Woodbridge, AT&T. Oh my god, the ad has a flip phone in it. That's how far away it was, y'all. The next must-visit wine country. They say Portugal's Douro Valley. Wow, I would like to go to Portugal. I will say that uh, a lot of people did take vacation to Portugal last year. It's really fascinating. I don't know what it was or what my friends read, but I know at least five or six people that went to Lisbon last year. Okay, a Pepperidge Farm ad. Wines of Argentina. Uh, Wine Lover's Guide to the New Douro. Uh, Crystal Cruises, okay. Tasting and testing, okay. So just like Bon Appetit, Food & Wine also has a test kitchen. Pretty much all of these major magazines have test kitchens. Um, for Put an Egg on It and Happy Family Night Market, I am the test kitchen. <laughs> Me singularly. <laughs> Which is very hard because ingredients cost so much, you know, unless we start getting some, some ingredient subsidy or donation or sponsorship in some way uh, with specialty ingredients. But... It can it can cost a lot to test recipes. I'm surprised that the big Thanksgiving feature was the 20s, 40s, 60s feature and nothing else. I mean, maybe in this this test kitchen feature, there's like pork and pink bean soup with corn muffin. Like that sounds like it would go for Thanksgiving as well, but it's not explicitly like. You know, these are other Thanksgiving dishes that you can do that are not prescriptive. Uh, creamy chicken soup with baby peas and carrots. Okay, cool. Uh, list of Chilean wines. Uh, an advertisement for the Cayman Islands. Oh boy. A big ad for Jamaica. Boy, Jamaica... Tourism board has a lot of money. They had a four-page spread in here. Okay, we're a lot of ads here. I thought the test kitchen section was going to be bigger. That was it? There was only like two pages of test kitchen stuff, and it was about soup. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry, I skipped over a page. I was wondering. I was like, why? Sorry, no, I'm not your baby. Don't call me baby. That's gross. 
Um, perfecting biscuits. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay, so this is great. There is a base biscuit recipe. And then three variations. Sweet lemon poppy. I've never made that. That sounds really good. Instead of relegating the lemon, lemon poppy to just um, muffin flavor, it could go in a Thanksgiving biscuit as well. Mm. Uh, there's also an herb gruyere. And then a savory cranberry walnut. That sounds good. I would also put bacon in the herb gruyere. Uh, Argentina and Chile, 17 best values, and this is all about wine. Mmm, Malbecs. I do like a Malbec. These are places I would like to go in the future, someday. Okay. Okay, Dean Fearing's Dallas Thanksgiving. This was teased on the cover story, and it looks very decadent. Um, wow. Look at this table setting. This is ridiculous. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about a Thanksgiving where you have to stand up to get the food and then sit down. I kind of like having the big communal table. You know? You know? Um, oh yeah, so this guy's whole thing is... Tex-Mex. So there's individually plated nachos, which drives me insane, but, you know, it's, it's, wow, okay. <laughs> uh, butternut squash soup with whipped pecan cream. That sounds delicious. Okay, let's read the menu. It's perfect holiday feast. Blood orange margaritas, Texas smoked salmon tartare. That sounds good. Uh, gingered butternut squash soup. Uh, roast turkey with tangerine glaze. I'm not sure where tangerine glaze comes from in Tex-Mex Tex cooking. Uh, tortilla cornbread dressing. Avocado relish with caramelized onions. Creamed onions with thyme and sage. Green beans and salsify with country ham. Brussels sprouts with cranberry butter. There's some, some southern flavors in here. And then a Texas State Fair pecan pie. Pumpkin pudding with meringue. All right. Uh, it's a lovely styled shoot. Can you imagine pretending it's Thanksgiving in August like we are today? <laughs> I mean, like I told you, a lot of these holiday uh, magazine shoots happen in the summer. So the, all these people, can you imagine, in Texas summer heat, are dressing up in full Thanksgiving like suits and fancy dresses? I like this idea of this Texas smoked salmon tartare. Let me try that. Oh. That was it. Okay. What is this? Okay, so this whole next section is a feature on tableware. So like the the props and the, the equipment. So they have recipes that go with these very specific, like, dishes. I have a lot of oddly shaped dishes in my house. But wow, these things retail like $284, excuse me? Uh, yeah, okay. I'm not the target audience, obviously. Lessons from a vineyard. Uh, who is this? Lisa Kring. A whole tour of a winery in here. Outstanding biodynamic wines. A meat master cooks in his dream kitchen. Bruce Idell. Do you know Idell's sausage? I've had that before. It is delicious. So that's Bruce Idell, the guy behind the, the sausage. Recipe file. Dr. Pepper glazed ham with prunes. Roasted rack of pork. Butternut squash bread pudding. Olive crusted leg of lamb. Yes. Cauliflower pilaf, Spanish-style braised beef brisket. That is a lot of meat dishes. 
I love that. But this is also like a brand play. Like, they're advertising the stuff in the kitchen to do this photo shoot. It's crazy. Dr. Pepper glaze ham. I am down with that. Sounds good. Green olive and lemon crusted leg of lamb. That also sounds really good. Idell's inspiration for this roasted leg of lamb was a dish he tried during the annual sheep festival in Saint Remy, Provence. During the festival, legs of lamb are strung up and cooked over an open fire, then served with a green olive tapenade. That tapenade became the basis for the lemon scented crust here. You can also use the crust as a stuffing in a boneless leg of lamb. <gasps> Yum! This sounds so good. It sounds really good. My mouth is watering. I'm almost ready for lunch. It's good because we're almost near the end of this. Wow. Bruce Idell. Um, we are near the end of the issue here, and there have been no women of color in any of the photos. You're cutting up a melon for slushy? Very nice. The Samsung ad. Ads, 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 ads. Last bite, apple cake with toffee crust. That looks beautiful. It's a nice shot. And an advertisement for a Hummer at the very end. I don't really see someone who reads Food & Wine. All these things that it was advertising toward, like vodka, ovens, wine, and then a Hummer at the end. I'm not sure <laughs> that matches. It's so funny. And then we have a Remy Martin ad at the back. Okay, so that was a big read through, uh, skimming, if you will, of Food & Wine Thanksgiving 2007. I know that this magazine has gotten better and has grown to do that to 2020. Um, yeah, Hummer was going for the housewife for a while. Wow. They had a mini Hummer. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, but yeah, that was the November 2007 issue of Food and Wine, Thanksgiving. Um, there are definitely some things in here that I would like to try. I was just surprised that uh, some things were editorialized and some things weren't. Uh, I'm surprised there wasn't more context around the Thanksgiving in your 20s, 40s, and 60s. Uh, and I'm not sure I agree with the way they divided those recipes because I think that people of all ages can enjoy all of those recipes. I think it's a difference of experience in the kitchen. Which is cool. All levels of people, you know, can make Thanksgiving. <laughs> Just depends on where your, where your entry point is and how much you can afford. You can make a really good Thanksgiving for a very affordable amount. Like, I think that last Thanksgiving I only spent, like, less than $50.00. Because I bought my turkey in parts, and we were just trying to use up stuff that was already in my pantry. So I already had mole that I brought back from Mexico once. I had all of these spices and, and things and things in my freezer. So anyway, we can talk about that on another stream some other time. But that's all I have for you today. If anyone has any questions about printed materials, how to make them, uh, what is my experience editing them, or if you uh, want to share something that you've read uh, over the past week, I'd love to share it with the group or tweet it out at least. Uh, feel free to tag me whenever you see something interesting uh, about food or printed material on the internet. This is my username, Randwitches. Um, I will be back streaming on Wednesday uh, with Attack the Pantry, which is uh, the my live stream where I talk about food in depth and answer your cooking questions. So thanks for hanging out with me on a Sunday. I hope that uh, you have a good rest of your Sunday. I'm going to go hang out with my friends and their new baby at a park, and I'm going to eat these ground cherries that I bought from the Greenpoint Farmer's Market from Brooklyn Grange. So uh, everybody grab a snack. I hope you get some lunch. Have a good rest of your Sunday, and I will see you on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Goodbye. Thanks for hanging out.